I can record. Uh, good day, Ian. The last time uh, Jeremy and I interviewed you was in Albany. Yeah, we went to those two sold out nights at the theater in Albany. It was that, those were two of the best shows I've seen in 2019 or 2018. 2019, I, was, I guess. I think it was 2019. It had to be because yeah. it was two back to back nights at the theater in Albany, and it was brilliant. That's right. It's, yes, it's, it's the one with the, uh, with the with the radio station underneath. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, yeah, and um, uh, Uriah Heap was opening. It, it was just it was brilliant, absolutely yeah. brilliant. You you, yeah. you you guys never disappoint. Uh, no, nope. you know. Well, let's get right into this, and uh, and let's talk about this big career-spanning box set out on October fifteenth. Previously unreleased tracks, and I mean, it's like forty-three CDs. This thing is re- absolutely ridiculous. Uh, let's <laughs> let's welcome the original member of Judas Priest, Mister Ian Hill. There he is, everybody. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yes. <laughs> and 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 by the way, when we say forty-two CDs ridiculous, we mean ridiculously good because yes, it is it's awesome. amazing. I, I don't. I mean, this you're giving Gene Simmons a run for his money at this point with this box set <laughs> well thanks for that <laughs> yeah so so to talk to me about this because 42 cds is a monster box set which comes with a monster price tag why not sort of divide this into 10 smaller releases or some five smaller releases what was the decision in saying listen we're just going to give you everything here enjoy I think it's, I don't know, it, that's, um, I mean, the, the marketing side of thing that, that sort of comes from the label anyway, for the most part. But um, well, people can always go and buy most of the stuff anyway in, in singular um, in singular units. But um, I don't know, like you say, it's such an impressive thing, like a box set. And, and the, 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 I don't know, the working brief is just throw everything at it, whatever we've got, throw at this box set. Right. Um, and we were lucky, you know, because we thought we'd already exhausted the vaults. We thought it, it had all gone, you know, with previous box sets and special releases and things. And suddenly all this other stuff starts going out of the woodwork, you know, it's in somebody's loft on the back of the cupboard. Right. Yeah, and people started, started to, you know, discover all this old uh, un, un, unreleased stuff. And um, we gave it to a long-standing producer, long-suffering producer, Tom Allen, uh, to go through. I mean, he knows more about the band than, than anybody, you know. Uh, to, to give it the sort of a mark of approval, um, whether it was um, safe for public consumption, that sort of thing. And yeah, he, he, he passed it all. He, he, might, he might have tweaked the sounds of it, but that's all he could do. Uh, a, a lot of the material, a lot, of, a lot of the more obscure stuff anyway, was just on basic two-track master, so um, right. he couldn't mix it, you know. He just had to tweak the knobs and try to make it sound a little bit better. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It seems like, you know, that you guys just had a bunch of cassette tapes from, like, Soundboard, and you pass it off to Tom and said, here, try and EQ this. Make it make it sound a little bit better than, you know. Yeah, there you go. Yep, you're, you're on the magic powder on it. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this. Since you were the originator, you were the, the, the guy at the beginning of, of Priest, uh, you went through different lineup changes, different singers, you know, until you got to Rob. When did you sort of decide or, or figure out, go, yeah, this is the lineup. You know, when you had Al and we had the other guys, and you go, mm, "We need this. We need we need a different guitarist. We need a different." When did you sort of realize that? Yeah, this lineup is is the one that's going to move forward. I don't think we did. Um, excuse me, my dog going off. It. Get out of it. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> that's my dog. I'm sorry. Maybe don't worry. Two behind, hiding behind him too. I got, I got two right here that will probably bark as soon as somebody opens a door. So don't worry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, what was I saying? Yeah, we, it was. It was it's born out of a necessity. Um, I've been going right back to the very early days when um, I was sort of Ken and myself and a, and a drummer called John Ellis, um, and, and Al Atkins later joined that, and we inherited the name Judas Priest from Alan, who was a member of the uh, the original Judas Priest from the from the, the year before. Um, there's that watershed moment. I mean, we, we, we'd got jobs and things, and um, on a local scale, it was great. You could come out of work, get cleaned up, make it to the show, come back, and get back to work in comparatively good shape the next day. But suddenly, you start to get offers coming from two, 300 miles away you know, on a Wednesday night. And you can't do that sort of thing if you've got a job. So we, we, we had to make a decision of whether we're going to make a go of it or whether just to stay local. And, and the three of us, Al and, and Ken and myself, said, OK, we'll, we'll knock our jobs on the head and make a go. But 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 John, he got a decent job, you know, and it's not the sort of thing that, that he, he was going to risk not at that stage. 
Because what, what John... he weren't making a great deal of money out of it. What, yeah, what yeah. job did John yeah. Perry get? What what job did John Perry get that he decided he's not uh, going to stick with Judas Priest? Oh, sorry, John Ellis. What? John Perry. Oh, well, John Perry. Or or what did John? What job did John get where he said, ah, or he John was, Ellis on drums? He, he got an apprenticeship um, at a company <laughs> nice. in West Bromwich called Kenrick and Jefferson's, and that they were a huge printing firm amongst other things. Like they were manufacturers. They were one of the biggest sort of manufacturers in the uh, in the area. And it was one of those things where, where there's a decent job at the end of the apprenticeship. Right. Um, Al, myself, and Ken were uh, doing the kind of things that you could pick up any time, you know, so we hadn't got anything to lose, really. Well, you um, weren't like a uh, paper boy or something, were you? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I worked in a, um, West Bromwich is famous for springs, huge lorry springs and things like that. Right. And uh, I, I worked at a firm that um, specialised in repairing them. <laughs> well, I mean, like, you know, to be fair, I mean, like the the pub in Leeds isn't paying as much as an apprenticeship, so probably it was a good decision on his part. That, that's that's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. So, and of course, then it comes around. Uh, we placed. Oh, it was um, Alan Moore did, did the first stint with the band, uh, replaced John, and he only stayed with us for a, for, a, for a matter of a couple of months, yep. and then he went off to to to, to join a band called Sundance, who they had got a record contract. Uh, already then you know so who could blame him for that mm -hmm. and then Chris Campbell came along and um, and he stayed with us right up until when uh, Alan's wife got pregnant and suddenly he had to go and get a real job because he needed to finance the family you know <laughs> right. so Alan went and and, um, and and Chris left with him and uh, we didn't know it then but it was probably one of the most fortuitous exits from the band because enter Rob Halford and John Hinch, you know, right. And, uh, and, and most of the rest, you know, but, but uh, then of course, Glenn, Glenn joins. That was a, that was a, it was a, a suggestion from uh, our first record company, Gull Records. Mm. That, um, oh, it wouldn't be safe. It'd be great with either another musician. They, they suggested the sax player. It's another ain't going to happen. <laughs> oh uh, either on a key keyboard player or a, or um or another guitarist you know and that, then Glenn came along and uh, we asked him to join and uh, that was it then we got the trade we got the trademark lineup after that we we weren't going to do anything yeah anything that did a major or majorly different than that you know so that, that's why we stayed. What, did Glenn the... have to audition or like well you know when he came in like what was it about Glenn's guitar playing that you just said ah yeah he's the guy it, 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 yeah Glenn Glenn played with a band called Flying Hat Band and uh, we'd done a couple of gigs with them. Uh, you know, over the over the previous uh, couple of years or so, and we knew he was a great guitarist. You know, from from then, and um, we just happened to see him in a music shop in Birmingham, and I asked him if he'd be interested, and yeah, he he was uh, he was keen to join. You know, nice. we got a record company. We had got a record contract by then. You know, because it was them that was suggesting the you know the extra guitarist, the extra musician. Um, and Flying Hat Band still hadn't got. They were still searching for a, for a record company. Flying Hat Band. I suppose that was yeah. a bit of a sweetener for Glenn. What, what I have, he, he agreed to join. What I, what I find interesting about the uh, the genesis of, of Judas Priest and Scorpions is that both bands went through like fourteen drummers before they actually <laughs> got to their lineup. What was it about drummers in Europe that you, that just couldn't be counted on that you had to keep replacing them? It's just... I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> You know, I think I think Spinal Tap even made it, you know, was joking about that in their movie because they released they they replaced their drummer like after like every album or something. One drummer like just mora just like randomly combusted in the middle of a yeah. show. <laughs> like just, you know. <laughs> let me get to yeah. the uh let me get to the I'll Tim Ripper. A few parallels there. <laughs> yeah. uh, this box set finally has the the Tim Ripper Owen stuff. It has been some, somewhat difficult to find on the streaming services and somewhat difficult to find in, in other official channels. But here it is. Um, talk to me about the, their inclusions and, and the part they play in the band's history. Because, you know, like, like it or lump it, Jugulator, Live Meltdown, Demolition, Live in London. It's a great continuation yeah. of the band. There's some great material on those two albums. Of course. Really is. Yes. Um, but there's, I mean, there's different record companies there as well, just different distributors. So there's contractual problems there, right. which is why we couldn't, you know, we, we, we couldn't release it all together um, right. before, you know. Um, but this time around, um, 
the powers that be come to an agreement and, and let it out, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it was a it was a bit of a low point for the band in one way. Um, Rob had left; we weren't playing to, to the large audiences anymore. Um, but uh, but the, like I say, musically there was some excellent excellent stuff on both of those albums. Uh, Demolition, Demolition in particular, is one of my favourite albums. Demolition, there's some tremendous stuff on there, you know. Um, but then again, and the Rob, shows Rob were made great. to come back to the band, and, and that was you know, I mean, even Tim could see that could, could see the sense of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, letting him back in a bit, being a, we're all fans of the band, you know, but he could see, yeah, uh, he could see that was the right way to go. But I, I got a chance to see Judas Priest with that lineup at the Hampton Casino Ballroom in, in New Hampshire, and it okay. was one of the greatest shows ever. I mean, here you have Judas Priest in your face with like 2,000 other fans, it was brilliant, and the lineup was, was brilliant. I mean, it was a great Judas Priest show, so you know, can't complain. No, we would, yeah. The, the, I mean, all the elements were still there, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the four of us were still there, but, you know, um, Glenn, Ken, uh, Scott, myself, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and a great vocalist. Tim was a tremendous voice, you know. It yeah. really does. Um, so all, all the elements for a great pre show were, were, were there all along, you know. I, I got a question for you. I'm just I'm really curious about this because Painkiller is one of my favorite albums of all time. And, it was the first record with Scott Travis on drums. Does he come in and play that opening to Painkiller as his audition? <laughs> how did how did that all happen? And how did you decide like to pick Scott to be the new man behind the skins? Um, we we we'd known Scott for some for some time. He played with a band called Rice Rex, and uh, Rob was familiar with him. He, he knew the other guys for uh, for some time. Um, and that that was it. I mean, Rob knew that he was a great drummer. You know. Yeah, and uh, he was he was one of the I think um, I think even Glenn Cornick remember Glenn Cornick from um, not Glenn Cornick Clive Bunker from uh, from Jethro Tull uh, he, he was up for the job as well yeah I know <laughs> but uh, but but Scott just about blew everybody away um, we, we we rented a, a big villa in, in in Spain in the middle of nowhere. And um, got Scott over there, and, and we'd already written most of Painkiller anyway, mm -hmm. and um, and just started working it out, and he, he handled it. It was brilliant. And um, the, the opening to Painkiller, he'd probably been practicing that for the rest of for the early part of his career. <laughs> it, it worked perfectly, you know. It, it and, was probably uh, his warm-up we drill. Uh, sorry. I said it was probably his warm-up drill or something. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's so it's so. Uh, anyway, he came out with that and. Uh, well, the rest is history. He's a tremendous drummer, you know, really is. He's a terrific he's guy incredible. as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And he's, a, he's an incredibly nice guy, too, having having met him a bunch of times. He's just super nice. Um, yeah. Well, let me get you over to Angel of Retribution, which is also on the uh, on the box set. It is the reunion album. It is the one where Rob comes back. I remember at the time a lot of talk in the media and a lot of this, and people were like, oh, is it going to be good? Is it blah, 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 blah. And it just blew everybody away. What kind of pressure were you facing to have a great album? Because in a sense, if it was a dud, it might have stopped the reunion and what you're doing just dead in the tracks. But instead, everybody went, whoa, best album of 2005. Yeah, yeah well, well, thanks for that. Yeah, but uh, I mean, we, we, when we're running through songs and, and getting the idea, I mean, Ken, Glenn and Rob know more than I do because they're, they're the songwriters. But if it ain't quality, it doesn't get it doesn't get passed anyway, you know. So um, by the time we got into the studio, we we knew we'd got some good material, and um, we 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 put it down really well, you know. Um, Roy Z did the production on that one, did a tremendous job, and uh, and yeah, I mean we we carried on. We couldn't carry on from from demolition really. That that had taken those two albums had taken a little bit of a different track. They, they were a much harder, much rawer sort of uh, sort of direction. So we sort of went back to painkillers, sort of imagine where we'd be if we were doing the next album from there, you know. Mm. And uh, that that was a very loose working working uh, idea, you know. And uh, and it's basically got up. We've been really lucky, you know. I mean, we 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 do what we what we want basically. And we've been very very lucky in, in as much as the, the fans have gone along with it, you know, and they've liked it too. 
So uh, we, we, we are lucky in that respect. We, we've never sort of thought, oh, yeah, the fans are going to expect this. And we can't do that because the fans don't want to do it, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, we just got on and done it and they've, they've gone along with it. And it, we've, you know, like I say, I feel extremely privileged to, to be able to get away with stuff like that, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the that's the funny thing though. It's like fans can be the worst in that way because it's like you know you think you're doing something. It's oh the fans are gonna love this, and then you put it on, and you're like oh what is this shit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then you can't really explore yourself. You're like well, we just want to have fun and put out this record. And it's like there's just so much. Do you still feel that pressure of like when you're putting stuff out of like oh are the fans are gonna like this or are you at the point you know 50 years later like you know what we're just doing this to have fun and whether people like it or not whatever at least we're doing it and we're getting a kick out of yeah. it. Well, I, I think like I said earlier we're all fans of the band, right. yeah. and I think if if, we, if we're pleasing ourselves, we're pretty much pleasing the, the fans as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, as long as it passes that uh, sort of quality yardstick, we're, right. uh, we're 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 onto something good generally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fans no, are true. fans are so annoying. They'll be like, oh, every album sounds the same, and then you do something different. They go, oh. It doesn't sound like the other. And he's just like, yeah. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, look, like, I, mean, I mean, at the at the end of the day, you even look at this big box set. It's like, you know, with all the live stuff, people are like, oh, but they don't have Electric Eye from Atlanta, 1984. <laughs> like, you know, where's I that? Know. <laughs> I know. But, you know, you, and, and then we, we can talk about Nostradamus, too. Let me let me just quickly yeah. take you over to the one album that I love that seems to be the one that everybody debates. And it's, of course, Turbo Lover. I, I mean, yeah. You're coming to uh, Montreal here later this year on your on your tour, and I keep thinking, what are the odds of them playing Parental Guidance? I love that fucking song. Please play it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, do do you look back at that album with pride or regret that you go, well, we sort of followed the Bon Jovi, Def Leppard, hit, glammy stuff, or do you just say, listen, it's a great album. Leave me alone. Yeah, I think um, it was it was one of the, one of the albums where we we were not worried, but a little bit. Concern, shall I say, because of we, we'd reached a, a, a level there with um, Defenders of the Faith, mm -hmm. and we reached pretty much the end of that road. And we've always tried to do something better, what we consider to be better, mm -hmm. and take a step forward with each album. And it would have been very, very difficult to take another step in that direction from that album, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite. It is, in fact, it is my favorite album, you know, because of that. Yeah. Turbo, um, your favorite or Defenders? Defenders. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's one of my favourites, if not the favourite. But we 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 got the uh, we got first refusal on these um, guitar synthesizers by by Roland, right. and we thought, well, well, maybe this is the next step, you know. Right. And uh, probably went a bit over the top with it, <laughs> but um, but, but that, that, I that love was a basic idea, you know, just to take that next door, next step forward and make things a little bit different. But, but uh, and you're right, the, um, it, it did. It, it lost us some fans. It did lose us some fans. Yeah. On the other hand, it gained us, gained, gained us new ones, you know. But what was the influence there? I mean, like, you know, records like uh, Pyromania had just come out and, you know. It, is, that, is that you, Mitch? Is that you? As, That's not as me, Rob Halford calling right now saying, stop talking shit about Turbo. <laughs> 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 but no, talking about Turbo, it's like, you know, you guys go down to Compass Point, you know, in the Bahamas. You're not, you know, necessarily, it's almost like a vacation, staycation, okay. workation, you know. What, what was the what was the influence behind that record? I mean, going to the synthesizer guitars and all that stuff. Like, you know, what, what, was it really influence from the record label or were you guys just saying, you know what, like I said, you know, let's have some fun? It was basically that, like, like I say, we, we, we had first, first refusal on those synthesizers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think anybody else was using or not many people were using them at the time. And um, we, we were looking, for, like I say, for something a little bit different, a little bit new, uh, another step forward. And that was uh, that was a basic thought behind all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I went ahead with it. And we were a little bit anxious about it, but whether it was going to be received by everybody or not. Um, but like I say, it, in the end, I mean, I look back on it now. I mean, it doesn't seem as radical as it did then. No, no. <laughs> but, but but at the time it did it did seem a, a huge step out of line, you know. Mm. Well, just just but, remember um, on um, uh, what are here uh, November fourth in uh, Laval, Quebec. Parental guidance. Just throw that in there, just for me. Yeah. Parental <laughs> just, just for me, because you, you never know. You never love that. Hey, let me ask you this. <laughs> yeah, I love that. We're recording this on August twenty uh, sixth, and on August twenty sixth, two thousand four, uh, Rob subbed for Ozzy on their on the Black Sabbath show in Camden, New Jersey. So 17 years yeah. to the day. 
what was that like for you? I mean, he had done a couple of shows back in the 90s, but what was that sort of day where the, the camp's going, oh my God, Ozzy's not going to sing, and, and they come to Rob? Just sort of the going on backstage where the decision was made and you went, oh yeah, our boy's going to go sing. Okay, this is going to yeah. be fun. Yeah, it was a hero moment, wasn't it? You know, yes. the, the, guy, the guy in the black hat rides up and saves the day. <laughs> yes, and it sounds uh, great. It was one of those things, you know, and, and Rob was familiar, at least with most of the Sabbath stuff, and that, that set this day happened to be playing. And um, he, he went on and nailed it, you know, and, and then he came off, had about 30 minutes and went on and nailed our set as well, you know. Uh, after we did our set, they went and nailed theirs as well. <laughs> Um, it, it was a little bit fortuitous, and we were special guests, and we only played about an hour and ten, hour and fifteen minutes, instead of the usual hour forty-five, two hours, you know. Uh, so we were still well, well fresher than he would have been if we'd have done our full set, but it was still very much a hero moment, you know. Um, he, he went out and he performed great. Everybody stood on the side of the stage and watched it. Yeah, I mean the 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 recording is uh, available as a bootleg everywhere, and they, it just sounds phenomenal. I mean, he really yeah. just. Yeah, rough on the voice though. Two sets in the same night, yeah. Same metal. Yeah, he, he was younger then. He, he could handle it then. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let him hear you say that. He'd be like, "What? I'll do it today. I'll show you." <laughs> That's we were, trouble. We were, he would as well. Yeah, <laughs> we, we were both younger then. Uh, the tour yeah. starts in September. Uh, of course, uh, Pete Merluzzi's uh, was the tour manager. Is Pete, is Pete still with you? No, he's um. Oh. He's, he's got other, he's got other irons in the fire at the moment, oh, well. and I don't think he could, he could afford. He's, he's got a, a new business starting up, oh. and I don't think he could afford the time away from that. So I um, think a lot of people are doing that through yeah. this pandemic. You know, everybody that used to be on the road, they're realizing like, oh, you know what? I think I should have a backup plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's true. That that was his idea. You know, um, yeah. nobody nobody was going anywhere from, from a performance point of view. How, and everybody, um, a lot of people, a lot of two or three other of the crew members, you know, got into other things, selling real estate and what have you, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, Pete, Pete was one of those. He found something else for, for himself to do and went ahead and. Uh, Here's a question and for you. That. Here's a super random question for you. Try and think at the top of your head. After 50 years of being in this band, how many bass techs have you gone through? Oh, actually, not not that many. Not that many. Most of the time, Glenn and myself used to share the tech anyway. Mm. Uh, seeing as we'd be both on stage left. And these days, very few things go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably, well, let me think, one, two, three, four, five, wow, probably about bad. seven. That's seven. Oh, seven. That's not a bad number yeah, at the, all. The guy that's been with me now has been with us for the last uh, three or four tours. You know, Jer uh, Jeremy, yeah. I'll say this. The, the bigger bands, the Metallicas, the Def Leppards, uh, they're very loyal to their crew. And if you ask Metallica, for example, they probably only have had two or three because they find the guy they like and they stick with him. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Success. I mean, we, we, we're blessed. we we got a tremendous crew. We really do, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Nucleus crew, of course. Um mm -hmm. We, we, we get the same guys every two if, if we possibly can. Of course, when we're not working, they, they, they go off and, and they work with other, other people, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we're lucky. We treat them well. So when we go out on tour, they, they want to come back to us. And, and they're great. They really are. Our, our production manager, uh, yeah. Martin Walker, he, he puts a great crew together. And now, we've been, been, Martin's been with us since the Ripper days, you know. So he's been wow. with us for a long time. Now, the, these uh, are rescheduled uh, dates that are coming up. Yeah. How confident are you today, August 26, 2021, that you're going to be able to get through the entire run? Because we see bands every day, uh, The Cult, Garth Brooks, they're just canceling. Uh, are you yeah. confident you're going to get through this? And, and so how do you stay safe? I mean, what's the plan? I mean, no backstage, no meet and greets, no... I'm afraid it's going to be that, you know, I mean... Um... We're all double jabbed and everything, right. so we're we're about as protected as, as we ever will be, right? Uh, unless something else comes out in the, in the meantime, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just that: be careful, and we're just going to keep our distance away from people. And if you go out in the evenings, try and keep a bubble together, you know, mm -hmm. and um, try and try and li limit the amount of other third parties you, you 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 get to see. You know, it's a sad thing because we all of us we've got friends and people that we. That we see every time they come around, but we 
this time around, we're going to have to be a little bit, uh, a little bit careful, I'm afraid. Yeah. yeah, unless you just hang out with vax vaccinated people, and hey, you're good. But you know, yeah, you never know. You know, you, 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 put you, up you a go to that one restaurant and you sit in the guy that coughs at you, and next thing you know, yeah. well, that's <laughs> yeah, it. I mean, you know, Kiss just uh, they started doing their meet and greets again, but they're doing them behind plexiglass, like they're like whales at Sea World. It's kind of hilarious. Oh, really? to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> I was well, cracking up. I saw the or something, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw the photo online. I'm like, guys, just just cancel it. Like, you know, it's literally them just standing behind plexiglass. Like, it's yeah. it's, it's such a funny visual. It's a great yeah, so it's visual. It's not quite touchy feely there. No, <laughs> it's not a very personal interaction. <laughs> and uh, I'll I'll uh, wrap up for my questions on this. Uh, you you have of course Richie Faulkner that came in in 2011. Andy Sneap has come in uh, in replacement. Um, talk to me about the impact of those two guitars, because Richie really reinvigorated. And, and when we look at bands that change members, we always get the, the, the portion of fans that say, yeah, but bring back so-and-so. And, -so. and yeah. nobody says that with Richie. They just go, ooh, that guy's a mother, you know, they they love yeah. him. Yeah. He, he, he's a tremendous talent. I think that's, that's the main thing. He, he is a, a brilliant guitarist. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, is, is a really genuinely lovely guy as well, you know. Yeah. Um, he doesn't take himself too seriously. He doesn't pretend to be something that he isn't. Um, he really is just, just a, a, a dream, really, to, from, from our point of view. Uh, and now he's been with us for over 10 years now. He's a member of the family. And um, he's, a, he's a fixture, you know, for as long as we carry on. And we, we, were, we were extremely lucky to find him. Um, and Andy, of course, uh, I mean, Andy came in, uh, one of the, one of the big reasons he came in, he just worked on, on firepower. Mm -hmm. And when it was quite obvious that Glenn couldn't really do the whole tour, he, 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 at that point he could have stood up and done a, done a show or two, but there was no way he could have done a, a grueling tour, you know, five, six shows a week. He couldn't have, been, he wouldn't have been able to do that. Uh, and Andy's there and he's ultimately familiar with the new with the new record you know mm -hmm. which we're playing four or five even six songs off there i think there's only one song we haven't played uh it's a great record no i think we might have played all of them at one time or another. <laughs> so at least andy's got a working working idea of of, uh, of the song you, you know you, you know yeah. the structure the basics about whatever He's so it's comparatively, com comparatively easy for him to, to to fall into that he's a great guitarist in his own right of course Yep. Um, and of course, he's also a fan of the band, so he's familiar with the older stuff as well, you know. So he, he was he was a, in the right space at the right time, and he was perfect for the job. Is he a member at this point, or is he still a producer who's just filling in, helping out? Uh, at this time, he's 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 helping out. Yeah, at this time, he's, he'll be, for me, we're extremely grateful. You know. Yeah. Not that he ain't getting paid for it because he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't think he's volunteering. <laughs> 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 well, hey, listen, uh, 50 Heavy Metal Years of Music comes out on October 15th. It's available now for pre-order wherever music is sold. And this box set is absolutely ginormous. Um, it comes with Ross Halfin photos signed by each band member. Uh, the box set designed by longtime collaborator Mark Wilkinson. He even got a numbered British Steel Metal Razor Blade in there, too. If that's not worth it on its own... I don't know what to tell you, people. Uh, memorabilia book. You got a replica of the British Steel tour programmees and all kinds of great stuff in there. 43-some CDs. Yep. Make sure you go pre-order this now. It's it's amazing. And um, maybe when you see them on the road, Ian will sign that through his little slot on the plexiglass for you. <laughs> <Back> <laughs> yeah, the end of the stick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Selfie stick. Put a Sharpie two, in two there. Two meters long stick, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Thank you, Ian. All right, okay. Ian. It was it was so great, great to chat, to and uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Okay, all the best. All the best. Cheers. Be safe. Thank Sorry. you. Bye.